Uh, I'm going to tell you something about Divine, and Divine is a tool which is kind of targeted to uh, discovery of hard-to-find bugs. Uh, I will mostly speak about what it does, not how it does it, so uh, that might be a little bit different. So basically, we have Divine, and I said that uh, it, uh, it's uh, used to discover hard-to-find problems in uh, programs uh, written in C or C++. Uh, in theory, it could be extended to uh, other, uh, other programming languages, mainly to the programming languages, which, are, which uh, can be uh, compiled to LLVM. Uh, but right now, we are using C and C++. So you can take a C source, or you can take a C++ source, do, uh, give it to Divine, and it will do something with it. Uh, or, uh, usually you don't have just one file, so you can take a, a C, C or C++ program, which has something like a make file or CMake, uh, and use uh, some special compiler, which we provide, and uh, compile this program specifically so that Divine can understand it. Uh, because Divine can't understand the binary or the source code directly, it has to have uh, some special representation. It's basically the LLVM uh, intermediate representation. If, if you know LLVM, if you don't know, it's, it doesn't really matter for this presentation. So you can take your project and you can, if it uses makefile, you can build it like this and then just point divine to the, uh, to the result and hopefully it will do something. Uh, so what can it do? Well, uh, it can say you that the program is correct, or it can say, tell you that it found some bug. Uh, of course, uh, as Camille had said, uh, tools which do formal verification are quite often quite hungry, so uh, it needs enough resources. Uh, and then it will tell you something. Or if the program is too big for Divine, it won't tell you anything, and it might eat all of your memory. So that, that the less funny part. Now, if it says that program is correct, then hopefully it really is correct. Now, if it does not say uh, it's correct, if it founds an error, it will tell you some sort of report. Uh, it will somehow describe the error. So what kinds of errors can Divine detect? Uh, the first kind is assertion violations. Basically, you have a program, and somewhere in the program, there is an assert statement. And if, this, uh, if the condition in this assert statement does not hold, that means that there is a bug in the program. So in this program, you can see that here is uh, uh, greater or equal. In the assert, there is only greater. So, so we can call this function with x equal to zero, and this will trip this assertion, right? Uh, and this program shows also one uh, another thing, uh, kind of uh, simplified here, but you can basically have some sort of input variable, some sort of variable that you say this variable has arbitrary value, and Divine can somehow work with this uh, for uh, things like uh, numbers. Uh, and it can tell you that if this x is equal to zero, then this assertion is stripped, or something like that. Uh, then you can find memory errors, uh, which means, for example, uh, accessing arrays out of bounds. So you have an array, you have an index, and you are accessing out of the array bounds. Uh, depending on uh, how uh, the array is allocated, this might be something quite easily to, uh, easy to discover by other tools, for example, by Volgrind. Uh, but if it is, for example, stack, stack allocated, or if there are any symbolic values, any variables which uh, have not unspecified value, then this might be uh, work for divine. Uh, Another uh, kind of uh, another example of uh, things that Divine can detect, which is quite a new one, is that it can detect uh, deadlocks in parallel programs or uh, 
cases when parallel programs do not terminate. Uh, so let's say that you have a parallel program, so this program runs two threads. One thread is waiting for something, it is waiting for x to, uh, it is waiting while x is not equal to zero, and the other thread which runs in parallel with it sets x to 42. Now, uh, we can look at this program and, uh, and uh, if, if there is a problem, it, uh, if this program can, uh, can loop, then uh, divine, uh, then divine will uh, say that the program does not terminate. Okay? Uh, okay. So now let's say that you want to try it. Uh, what you need except for obtaining divine itself. Uh, so you have to obtain the source code of the program. You need the source code. It's not enough to uh, have uh, binary, but uh, we are now we are here concerned about open source development. So this is hopefully not a problem. Uh, uh, and it should be in C or C++. Uh, and now we are getting to the first kind of hurdle uh, that you also need your dependencies. Uh, so you need, uh, you need all the libraries the, the code uh, needs because we have to analyze the complete program, right? Uh, well, you don't really need all of them. The standard C and C++ library are provided because basically every program in C or C++ uses them. Uh, it must be possible to build it by Clang. If it uses some GCC magic, then it won't work. Uh, it should not contain any inline assembly. And that's, the, that's basically the things which kind of uh, the basics. And then you need some, some criteria, some tests, something that you want to actually check that uh, that this is uh, this is correct. You, this is uh, a main difference compared to static analysis tools, which basically can look at the source uh, at the source code as a whole and say, okay, here something is fishy in this part of the program. Uh, we need some tests. We need uh, we need uh, to be able to really execute the code, and we are basically checking if in this test case there are some problems. So hopefully your program comes with tests, and hopefully these tests are usable. Uh, but really not all tests are usable for this work. Uh, for example, I was talking about concurrency, uh, about, for example, non-termination in concurrency, but you can, you can use Divine, and Divine was originally designed for checking concurrent programs for assertion safety, for memory safety. Uh, so uh, with concurrent programs, a lot of tests are stress tests. So basically, let's say that you have a concurrent queue and you want to test it. Uh, so you will, let's say, take 10 threads and each thread will write a million items to the queue and you will check that everything is okay, right? Because you are expecting, if there is an error, that the error will not manifest itself at any at, uh, uh, all the time, that it will manifest itself only sometimes. So you do a lot of operations with the, with the data structure. These kinds of tests cannot be run with Divine because they are too big. Uh, so this is an example of tests that, that you uh, can't really use. Also, you can't, for example, use tests which are dependent on timing. For example, in the C++ standard library, it's threading part. There is a lot of tests which basically do something like run a thread, then wait half a second, and then check that the thread did something. Uh, we can't really use these tests in Divine, okay? Uh, because uh, we, we would have to somehow have a model of timing and uh, which would uh, somehow be not, uh, which Divine doesn't really uh, understand. Uh, uh, but you can write some tests yourself, and sometimes, in some cases, it is actually, 
quite powerful, uh, device is quite powerful in this way. You can write more powerful tests than uh, your standard unit tests in, in, in uh, some cases. So one thing that you can do is use these unspecified values. You can say that x has some value, which is, for example, a positive integer, right? And then you can feed this to some, uh, to some function. Or uh, in case of concurrent programs, you can uh, write tests which now don't need to be stress tests, uh, because Divine will check that uh, given your two threads, which are in the test, it will basically look if there is any possibility that these two threads will interact with themselves such that there will be an error. So it will check all the possibilities of interactions. So therefore, you don't need to have a great big uh, stress test in hope that uh, the interaction which causes a problem will happen somewhere during the long run of the stress test. Uh, we are saying that the tests in Divine, and uh, it's uh, very important for concurrency tests, are deterministic. Basically, given the test in Divine, this test either always fails or always succeeds. While if you have a test of a concurrent data structure uh, and you are running it normally, it may sometimes succeed and sometimes fail if there is a bug in the data structure, but the bug manifests itself rarely. Okay. So these tests can be small, but you have to now write them yourself. Okay, uh, yeah, I have already told you that. So now, uh, I have already told you that the, that the verification can be quite resource intensive, and we can't really say directly uh, what are the causes. There are some which usually cause uh, it to be big, uh, basically, there is parallelism, there are these uh, symbolic or unspecified values, and there are uh, some complex memory manipulations like bit fields and something like that, which slow down the verification. Uh, yeah. Uh, now, let's say that you know there is some error, you can analyze it with uh, some sort of uh, debugger-like tool that we provide for you. Okay, uh, now uh, there can be more because programs often interact with some environment around them, right? So, uh, for example, it can write to file system or it can uh, download something from the internet or over the network and sometimes this can be also modeled and used in Divine. We have, uh, we have uh, support for parts of POSIX, uh, and it can be either modeled, so uh, you, for example, say that this uh, input can be arbitrary, or you can have some kind of mock client servers, uh, clients or servers, or you can somehow say, okay, now I will let the program run and interact with its environment, and I will capture how it interacts, and then I will use this capture later in the verification. Uh, again, this is a kind of a complex thing. It has uh, some limitations. Uh, for example, uh, we have, we are, if we are using this capture, we are somehow limited to the interactions which happened uh, when we were capturing the behavior. If uh, the program now decides because it, uh, let's say, interleaves threads, uh, in a different way and something happens differently that it wants to download another file from the internet, we won't have it in the capture, so it won't wo really work. Uh, okay, and this is, can also be used with our debugger uh, to, to, for debugging programs which interact, uh, because you can have the capture and now when you are debugging, you don't really need to interact uh, with the environment. Okay. And finally, there are some uh, things which are really work in progress, uh, so uh, which someday will hopefully work. Uh, we are working on a way to take binaries and verify the binaries. So right now, we were going from source code to LLVM, 
and verifying LLVM. We are working on a way to go from binaries to LLVM and then analyze the LLVM obtained from the binaries. There are some limitations. Uh, yeah, sorry. There are some limitations. For example, it might be hard to recover bounds of stack variab variables from the binaries. So it might not be as precise, especially if you don't have debugging information as uh, if you were going from the source code. But this would allow uh, analysis of programs without source code, and it would also allow you to use your system compiler uh, in the process of verification, not the replacement one. Uh, and also, we, uh, as I have said, uh, the program can be big for divine. Uh, one way to deal with this is to use abstractions, uh, which uh, allow us to somehow make a more compact representation of the data uh, at the cost that it might not be as precise. Okay. Uh, but we would like to do it in a way which still provides some guarantees. So, for example, you can say that if an error was not found, that there really was no error. But it may happen that it will be able to find an error which does not exist. Or, in some cases, it can be uh, made the other way around. Okay. Okay, thank you. So we have time for <laughs> questions. Honza Fedor, go for it. Okay, I would have uh, actually two questions to the interleavings, to thread interleavings. First, you said you explore all the possible thread interleavings yeah. when uh, aiming at the parallel bugs. So you don't use any kind, or do you use any kind of partial order reduction in that yeah. case? Uh, yeah, we do. Uh, okay. Yeah, uh, if I was, it was a bit imprecise. We explore all. Uh, interleavings, which we basically have to explore in order to have some sort of representative uh, I see, I see. sample. Okay. And the other question is also related to this. Uh, if you said you record the uh, divine analysis run for later replaying, uh -huh. uh, so you don't. And, and then you said if, if, if uh, for example, the thread interleavings is different and the uh, program needs to download another file from the internet, uh, so we don't actually record the particle thread interleaving of the program, or uh, did I Yeah, got uh, it okay. Uh, yeah, basically it wasn't uh, completely clear. We are recording interactions with the operating system. So okay, we are okay. exploring basically system calls. Uh, not exploring, we are recording system calls, and then we are checking that for these inputs we have this output of the system call in the record. But does it make sense, right, to, to, to record also the uh, interleavings and then to be able to reply precisely this particular one? Uh, it would make sense for the debugging experience, basically. Yeah. Uh, but the original motivation was, let's say we don't want to model the environment, let's say we record it, and then uh, we can explore more runs using this environment, but maybe not all. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Other questions? <laughs> okay, so Honza Fedor this time. Uh, okay. I'm sorry. So I have several questions. So one is a kind of follow up on uh, Honza Kofrov when he mentions the recording. So if you uh, if you record only a system calls, does not, does that mean that actually the replay uh, it may be there may be possible to get different executions uh, from uh, the replay trace because there may be different interleavings uh, when trying to replaying it. Uh, uh, between between the system calls because you do not uh, see how exactly the instructions between the system calls were interleaved and they may actually influence uh, uh, some uh, some errors in a way so uh, uh, if if you just use this kind of checkpoints uh, mm -hmm. uh, then uh, you may have you know uh, a wall set of possible execution that still get through these checkpoints uh, and uh, are still valid from this point of view. Yeah. Yes, uh, yes, we, we can explore multiple interleavings which uh, basically call the, uh, the system calls with the same arguments. So let's say, uh, in, and right now it's in the same order, so let's say 
that, uh, oh, well, you can have Martlip on enter leavings, which call the system calls in the same order with the same arguments, and then they can be explored. But if uh, they call some system call with a different argument, or they swap some of them, then we right now reject this. Uh, this could be relaxed uh, in some ways. In some, sometimes uh, it would be possible to swap the system calls and still uh, consider this to be a valid interleaving for the same recording, but we don't do it right now. Okay, uh, so another question, you mentioned uh, that your tests are deterministic uh, compared to the well, usual uh, test cases. Uh, uh -huh. Can you, uh, you know, uh, specify it more, uh, what do you mean by that? Uh, uh, wh wh what makes your tests deterministic compared to the well, inherently non-deterministic uh, 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 test for concurrency errors, if you take into account that actually, you know, uh, you are not actually forcing a specific interleaving because there will be no point on actually performing the test if you already know how the concurrency, uh, how the interleavings are actually uh, executed. Okay, so <clears throat> when we are running a test in Divine, uh, we are exploring all the interleavings which basically uh, to basically cover all the possible outcomes of the test. So, so we then say that there is no error if none of these interleavings can find an error. In none of so these. So, what do you mean by uh, deterministic here? As this, if you uh, explore all of the possible interleavings and you do not have kind of sleeps and so on that are uh, mm, problematic for your tool, then you uh, deterministically, you know, search everything in the end. We search everything. Yeah. I mean, deterministic in the sense that the, in the sense of the result of the test. Yeah. Test itself can run in multiple ways, but I mean, the yeah, test you will search all of the possible. Yeah, uh, we will search all of the possibilities. In the export space, and yeah. therefore, we can always say if there is an error or not an error. Yeah. Okay. okay. So I'm sorry, to Hansa, I will give chance to some other people also. So okay. and then we can go back to Hansa. Uh, okay. Uh, I don't think it goes through the. Uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, you mentioned multiple times that uh, Divine can run out of resources. I wonder uh, what is the scope we're talking here about? Like, uh, is it hundreds of lines of code? Or I know that it depends much on, on the complexity of the of the program if it uses dynamic data structures and so on. But yeah. just to have a, an idea of okay. how large programs are just too big. Okay, I can I can go by examples basically. Uh, so let's say we have uh, analyzed a concurrent uh, log-free uh, reader-writer queue, which has a one reader and write one writer. That is quite a small program for Divine. Uh, then we have analyzed a concurrent log-free hash table uh, with uh, multiple writers, and uh, this is a, quite a bigger. Uh, piece of code because it, it has fine-grained uh, parallelism. It basically allows multiple threads to write at once if they are not conflicting in the same, uh, if they are not using the same cell in the hash table. Uh, and uh, in this case, we were able basically to uh, fill the, to use up to three threads with a few elements inserted in the hash table and the hash table could grow uh, between the inserts. So that, uh, that, was, uh, that was already quite a big program. So basically it's primarily not really about lines of code, more about the number of threads. Uh, two threads are often okay, three threads uh, sometimes, sometimes not, depending on the complexity of the code. Uh, more threads if uh, it could work, basically for programs which use a lot of logs and therefore it's not a lot of parallelism really, but uh, it, it, uh, the complexity grows quite fast in the number of threads, not, uh, not, not that much in the number of lines of code. Okay, thank you. Okay, one more question. Uh, okay. 
uh, also, if I may continue a little bit, uh, if we are talking about par uh, programs which do not have a lot of inputs, if there are a lot of inputs, then it grows also with the inputs. Okay, uh, I've got a question. Uh, how about when you got, you told uh, in the first uh, quest question or answer for the question that you are changing the system calls um, like a bit to identify the possible runs of the program. How do you handle when the program has a secomp inside that it's, um, do you know secomp or no? Uh, I am not Okay, sure. uh, it's a library that can uh, like validate the system calls, that if you run some undefined system calls in the code, it will terminate the process. Okay. Or the, the, uh, different, sorry, uh, different arguments in that. So should I turn it off when I'm trying divine on my my program that has second inside, or can be, can it be turned on? I don't know what would happen if you try to program with this uh, with this thing. Provided that it is just a layer between the program and the system calls, then it might be possible to make it work, but I don't know. Okay, thank you. Okay, I'm happy for the discussion, but it's time to move on. So let's thank the speaker once more.